Good morning. My name is Leon Brzezinski. I'm the President Emeritus of the Wisconsin Alliance for Retired Americans, and I thank you for coming this morning to hear about uh, what's being planned for Social Security and Medicare. I'm going to talk about the Social Security piece. Before I start, I hope you all grabbed a handful. There's uh, handouts on the counter over there that touch each of the topics that I'm going to allude to. Uh, first of all, I just need to let you, give you a little information on who the Wisconsin Alliance for Retired Americans is. We represent over 107,000 Wisconsin retirees. A uh, majority of them are union retirees uh, through their local union retirement programs. But we also represent uh, tens of thousands who are not union retirees. Our two uh, organizations that were closely aligned with our Citizen Action of Wisconsin and, and CWAG, the Coalition of Wisconsin Aging Groups, and that gives us numbers in an area of 340 to 350,000 uh, residents in Wisconsin who are uh, part and parcel of the information process that we have. We, uh, our main goal is to uh, provide public education and advocacy for uh, current families and uh, current uh, seniors and their families. Uh, people ask me why have I been involved in this. I've been retired for several years. It's because a lot of people work really hard to get the benefits that I enjoy in retirement, that we enjoy in retirement. And the way it stands right now with what's been happening the last several years, our children and our grandchildren are going to work till the day they die. And that's really important to me because my children and grandchildren should have what I have, and that was a little better lifestyle than my parents and my grandparents. And so it's important to me that we get this information out and let people know that how important these programs are. When we talk about uh, the discussion that's going on, uh, and you hear it on the radio air or TV every day now and in the newspapers, about the, uh, the deficit and uh, the debt and the but, the federal, all federal but uh, federal spending. First of all, Social Security had nothing to do, doesn't, not, didn't bring a single dime into that deficit. The whole idea of the budget problems have to do what took place from uh, around 2002 to 2010. And that was uh, two wars that weren't paid for, uh, large tax cuts, a huge tax cut in the early 2000s that wasn't paid for, uh, the uh, Medicare Part D program that wasn't paid for, that's over $500 billion, and double-digit increases in health care over the course of the 2000 to 2010. And all of that money that provided those programs and paid for those wars was borrowed. That's why we owe the Chinese about $3 trillion. So when they talk about the budget, Social Security has nothing to do with that. Social Security does have a $2.7 trillion uh, uh, fund, the trust fund, and that trust fund was established by the Greenspan Commission in 1983 because in 1983 Social Security was in trouble for its funding. And the Greenspan Commission was put together by President Reagan to look at Social Security and figure out how they could make it so it would last well into the future. And their recommendations, and for those of us that work and remember that, that's when the Social Security deduction on your check was increased. And because all the baby boomers were born, and we knew the baby boomers were coming. So we had to put money aside to make sure that the baby boomers who are retiring now uh, would be, that they'd be covered uh, during their uh, retirement lifetime. So the Greenspan Commission did, recommended that. They recommended putting this money aside. And they recommended one other thing, and that was to index the Social Security cap, and I'm going to talk about that cap a little more later, to 90% of the median income. Had they done that, we wouldn't even be having this discussion. But the one thing that Congress took out was that indexing. And right now, Social Security, the cap is equal to about 82% of the median income. 8% doesn't sound like much, but when you look at the kind of dollars, the trillions of dollars we're talking about in gross domestic product, it's a huge number. When we talk about Social Security, when they say, uh, this is the, the, the politician's favorite term, is we want to fix Social Security and Medicare. Fix means the same to Social Security and Medicare as it does to dogs and cats. Think about that for a minute. Fixing Medicare, fixing Social Security is the same thing as fixing a dog or a cat. It means cut. Cut, cut, cut. That's what they're talking about. And there's three, four ways that they're talking about cutting Social Security. Privatizing, 
increase the retirement age to 70, the use of the chain CPI, and I'll talk about all these in a little bit, and means testing. Uh, first of all, privatizing. That's been on the table since uh, the first, Reagan, uh, first Bush years, and then again in the second Bush years, and Paul Ryan's been pushing that, our own Wisconsin congressman. By privatizing, does he want to put all the money in Wall Street? Well, look at it this way. If those security funds, if that $2.7 trillion had been in Wall Street in 2008, when Wall Street, when the value of Wall Street dropped 49%, that would have cut that fund right in half. And it wouldn't be back today to where it was then. Wall Street, the, uh, the Dow is higher, but the value isn't. Retirees lost around $6 trillion in their nest eggs in the crash in 2008. And they haven't got it back. The, uh, the means testing. Means testing, uh, what they're saying is, well, if you already make a lot of money, we shouldn't give you quite as much Social Security. Unfortunately, when you look at what means testing, actually the impact of it, it means that if you made $40,000 while you were working, you're going to have your Social Security cut. That's the bottom line of means testing. So they're going to say, well, if you made $40,000, you must have some money put away. You know, there's all this that we must have money put away. And that whole must have money put away, we're the last generation to have money put away. The savings rate has been zero for years and years now. The dollar that a person makes today is worth the same as it was in 1973 when you factor in inflation. So in other words, for 30 years, at more than 30 years, working people have been going backward with their earnings. When they talk about the uh, increase in your retirement age to 70, you recall that, and some of us have been already come out of this, they increased the retirement age as part of the Greenspan Commission to 67, and they did it a one month a year for however many years it took. It's still in process. Increase, that was a 15% cut in Social Security. Increasing it to 70 would be another 15% cut. And I can't for the life of me. I was a construction electrician my entire career until I, toward the end of my career when I worked for the uh, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. But I can't imagine doing electrical work till I'm age 70. I'm 71 now, and, and I'm beat physically in every which way. The idea of people that work in factories, that work in any kind of job that requires uh, standing all day. Uh, school teachers, you know, folks that are on their feet all day to work till they're 70 uh, because that's when they can first get their full social security, it makes no sense. The chain CPI, that is really something that uh, most people don't understand. And the chain, the right now, the cost of living uh, formula is based on, uh, on a, the standard consumer price index increase from year to year in the third quarter. The chain CPI that they wanted, that they're recommending changing to, uh, is based on the premise that if something costs too much, you'll buy the next cheaper thing. <laughs> Let me explain that in real words. If Cadillacs cost too much and you like Cadillacs when you can't afford it, you'll buy a Chevy. When a Chevy's too expensive, you buy a Yugo. And when you can't afford a Yugo, I guess you buy a bicycle. That's how the chain CPI works, and I'm not exaggerating. If steak is too expensive, you buy chicken. When you can't afford chicken, you buy canned Spam. I guess for us, uh, and since, uh, since retirees, a major part of our expenses are health care, if you can't afford a quadruple bypass that you need, we'll give you two this year and maybe two two years from now. If you can't afford a wheel... Uh, knee replacement or hip replacement will get you a wheelchair. I mean, that's the mentality of the chain CPI. And that's being pushed uh, by, uh, by Republicans and Democrats. And in fact, the word is that even the president bought into this song and dance about how we got to quote unquote fix Social Security. The problem with the chain CPI, for instance, the last little increase, remember last year we finally got an increase of 1.7%. If they had used the chain CPI, it would have been 1.3%. Doesn't sound like much, but that's uh, several hundred dollars over the course of, and it's just like uh, uh, compounding interest. It, each year you, you go further and further down the ladder. You lose more and more. So this whole idea that uh, we should uh, 
buy into quote unquote fixing social security a program that really doesn't need to be fixed prior to the inaction of social security almost fifty percent of the seniors lived in poverty i'm sure many of you i remember most of us had a family member an elderly family member living with us that was the way the elderly were handled were housed in those days and in the rural communities that worked because families were close together and you could shift mom and dad around or mom and dad owned the farm and when the kids took over part of the deal was well you got mom and dad also and you can drive through central wisconsin where i lived and you'll see a lot of farms with another house built next to a farmhouse and then a house built next to it where the kids lived in the house and mom and dad lived in a new house uh, that worked then but in today's society with the uh, children moving away and to be quite honest with you i got seven kids and i don't want to live with any of them so the idea that living with our kids is, is, is the answer to this uh, flies in the face of reality. The other thing about Social Security, what if we don't do anything? If we don't do anything, when the trust fund finally is, runs out, is finally spent in 2034, 2035, depending on whose numbers you use, retirees at that time will get 72% of what they're being promised today when they get their Social Security state. That 70% is more factored for inflation than we're getting right now, based on the fact that the economy is going to continue to grow. So it isn't like they're going to be left homeless or helpless or, or penniless. It's just they aren't going to get quite as much as they thought. I, I'm not advocating that. But the fact is, Social Security is not in trouble. It's a program that we use an actuarial study for 75 years when no one has an idea of what's going to happen 75 years out. I can say this, the actuaries come up with three different possibilities for 75 year of financing. Uh, being actuaries, there's a high, medium, and low. They always take the medium one, saying, well, we, gotta, we don't want to be too low, we don't want to be too high. And there's only about a 2% or 2.5% difference between each one of these, from here to here and here to here. So they always take the, the, the uh, middle one. If you look back for the entire life, 78 years of Social Security, the financial system, the United States financial system, has mirrored the upper uh, estimate of the actuaries through the entire time. So there's a possibility that we don't have, there's not even a problem using this actuarial study over 75 years. The long and the short of it is, is Social Security needs some attention if, if in fact we're going to follow the recommendations of the actuaries and what they really should do is uh, look into the uh, I got it here. So a couple of the proposals that are in place one is uh, Senate Bill 117 the Medicare prescription drug we'll price, oh that. that's yeah. Medicare, I'm sorry yeah. gotta get back to 567 567 which is uh, Senators uh, Harkins and Bagich which propose increasing the benefit formula, so it averages, uh, that average uh, increase would be $65 a month. Not a great amount, but for people that are uh, getting a small amount to start with, the average is around $12,000 a year. This is the document that Leon's talking about. It says at the top, Strengthening Social Security Act of 2013. And the major way to pay for that would be to increase the cap, that cap that I talked about earlier, that's now capped at around 113000 and it moves according to some little formula that doesn't keep up with inflation. Uh, as I said, when, uh, when the Greenspan Commission finished their study, the Social Security was at 90% of the mean income. Uh, today it's at 82%. And the other thing would be to adopt what's called a CIPE, which is a cost of living adjustment geared toward goods and services typically used by seniors. In other words, medical expenses and th those types of uh, of uh, expenses. Uh, given that, I guess I don't want to take too much more of your time because Billy's got to talk about Medicare. Any questions on what I just talked about? Yes? Well, it's not a question, it's a statement, but I did some looking on the, uh, up on this cap and I took an average uh, CEO salary of around six million dollars a year. Do <laughs> yeah. uh, you know how long it would take him to pay his, so all his social security taxes? Probably about two hours. No, actually, six days. Okay. Then he's done. He oh, yeah, yeah, pay yeah. Any more Social Security yeah. taxes for the year. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's amazing the, uh, the number of, the, you know, I, I remember, a lot of us remember, 
uh, in construction. I used to have my Social Security paid by June or July. I remember we got that little couple, three, four dollar bump on the check, and it was like, boy, this is great. Um, and then, of course, it, it kept going up, up, up to where it's, like I say, a little over 113,000 now. Any mm -hmm. other questions or comments? With that, I'll turn it over to Billy. Just one more comment from what Leon was saying. You also have a, a document that's the, it's the um, members of the Wisconsin Congressional Delegation. And one of the bills um, is Senate Bill 567, uh, which you have a copy of. Um, after I get done, we're, we're really looking for help. We're doing um, these town hall meetings and senior, we're going to the Senior Center in Green Bay today. And the idea is, is if people agree with the bills that we're talking about, we're asking each of you to either call or uh, write a note um, to, and I, th I think your congressman is Petri, right? And then there are two US, U.S. Senators, uh, Baldwin and Johnson. So if you do agree with what we're talking about in terms of these bills, which I'm going to talk about two of them, please contact them and let them know your feelings about that. So as Leon said, I'm going to talk about um, Medicare and the Affordable Health Care Act, um, specifically um, as it relates to Medicare beneficiaries, but also how as it relates to the general public. And as you know, the Affordable Health Care Act, better known as Obamacare, uh, passed the Congress back in 2010, March of 2010. And before I talk specifically the impact that the Affordable Health Care Act impacts on people like yourself in the room here, Medicare beneficiaries. I want to talk generally why that we think there's a number of good things uh, about the law. And there's some things that we think should get changed, but here are some of the good things. One, under the law, a child 18 and under can no longer be banned or kicked off an insurance plan if they have a pre-existing condition. The same thing will happen to adults who have pre-existing conditions in 2000, starting in 2014. Under the law, premiums, you, the insurance companies have to spend revenues of the premiums, 80% minimally, for paying for your medical expenses. Under the law, the insurance companies can no longer have a cap on the amount of money they spent on you for medical expenses lifetime. In 2014, there will no longer be a cap on the amount of money annually that an insurance company pays on your medical expenses. Under the law, kids 26 and under can stay on their parents' insurance plan. Under the law, starting in 2014, Wisconsin uninsured people, as well as other American citizens around the country, which it's roughly about 35 to 40 million Americans who are uninsured today, they will need to sign up with an insurance plan. If they have a certain income, they could get a subsidy to help pay for some of those costs. Small businesses that have 50 or fewer workers no, do not have to, uh, they're exempt from the law. But if those small businesses decide they want to cover their employees, and the only reason they can't right now is because of the affordability, they will get a 35% tax credit for insuring those employees that they work for, that work for the small business. Again, small businesses that have 50 or, or less workers are exempt from the law, but if they decide to cover their, uh, insure, uh, cover their employees, they will get a 35% tax credit. And the most controversial piece, before I talk about Medicare beneficiaries and the Affordable Health Care Act, is that everyone is required to sign up for a plan. Um, in our state currently, there's about 13 insurance plans right now that doesn't mean that in Sheboygan that there are 13 insurance plans, but around the state there are 13 private insurance companies right now that um, people can sign up for depending on where they live. Um, if they decide not to do it, they will be penalized. Uh, one of our concerns is that the penalty is, is not very big the first year. Now some people might be upset when I say that, 
But right now, everybody in this room, who, if they're insured, pays for the uninsured. And if Billy Feilinger is uninsured and my child gets hurt playing soccer, where do I go? If I don't have a primary care doctor, I go to the emergency, sir, the emergency department um, in a hospital. Well, guess who pays for all that? Everybody here helps pay for my daughter's um, uh, pain, uh, injury um, because I don't have a primary care doctor. And besides that, if I did have health insurance and go to a primary care doctor, it'd be significantly less for the cost for those medical services going to a primary care doctor than I would, as a responsible father, taking uh, my daughter to the emergency room to have um, her injury taken care of. Now as it relates to the Medicare beneficiaries and the impact the Affordable Health Care Act has on people in the room here. First, under the law, if um, you want to have a wellness checkup or certain preventive services like mammograms and colonoscopies, you will no longer have to pay a copay or a deductible for certain preventive services. I didn't say uh, an annual physical, I said a wellness checkup. It's about 15 or 20 minutes that you have counseling with your primary care doctor. That and certain primary care, uh, primary um, preventive services like mammograms, like colonoscopies, there will no longer be a copay or a deductible. Why is that important? It, the reason it's important is because 75% of health care costs, spending, not just for Medicare, but the entire health care system, is due to chronic disease. So there are people in our country today who unfortunately were born genetically with chronic diseases, or they're not taking care of themselves a senior, and if they keep on gaining weight, uh, they're going to get closer to becoming a diabetic, as an example. So why do we think these, these preventive services, hopefully, with no co-pays and no deductibles, hopefully can manage the person who, God forbid, had uh, genetic chronic disease when they were born? And then those who are not taking care of themselves, um, those preventive services can help, hopefully, do a better job in preventing them going down the path of becoming a diabetic. Obviously, if people don't take some personal responsibility, um, we will not be successful in what I've just said, basically. Anybody here on Medicare Part D? If you remember back in 2003, uh, Medicare Part D, uh, that's not the exact technical law, but Medicare Part D was passed in 2003. It didn't get started until 2006. It passed by one vote in the middle of the night by one vote Medicare Part D, and I'm going to explain why I just said that in a couple minutes. So under the law today in 2013, if you spend in 2013 $2,900 for your medications up to $7,600, that's called the donut hole. It's the, um, it's the spending gap where until the law changed, people had to pay 100% for their medications from $2,900 to $7,600. In 2013, because the law passed back in 2010, if you fall into the donut hole, which means $2,900 up to $7,600, if you're using a brand name prescription drug, you will get a 50% discount for a brand name prescription drug if you fall into the donut hole. If you are, have a generic prescription drug, you will get a 14% discount. Under the law, which we're not happy about, under the law, the donut hole will be totally closed and no longer exist by the year 2020. We think it should be much sooner than that, but that's what the law says. Now, just a sidebar for a quick second. The president's budget, which will now be debated as Leon and I are talking about, about the federal deficit, the debt ceiling debate. In his budget, he has a provision that says that the donut hole will be closed by the year 2015. Since none of us know what will happen, and you can just, as you know, we've been following Congress and, and the problems of trying to get, uh, solve some of these problems, um, 
we're hoping that'll stay in at least his budget because then the donut hole will be closed by the year 2015. Anybody on Medicare Advantage? Medicare Advantage, okay. Under Medicare Advantage, which, and this is not fair to compare, traditional Medicare and people on Medicare Advantage, but under the law, we, including the people who are um, using Medicare Advantage, we're paying a 13 to 18 percent tax subsidy to private insurance companies who do Medicare Advantage. We, all of us, pay that subsidy. It's not fair to compare traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage. You get better benefits under Medicare Advantage, but not to the tune of 13 to 18 percent tax subsidies that we all pay the private insurance companies, including the folks who are covered under Medicare Advantage. Under the law, Medicare Advantage will continue. In fact, it's actually grown. People have signed up more in Medicare Advantage since the law passing in 2010. But that tax subsidy to those private insurance companies like Humana, like Aurora, a whole range of different private insurance companies, that will be reduced, the subsidy. Medicare Advantage will still exist, there will still be tax subsidies, but there will be a savings from some of the tax subsidies being reduced for Medicare Advantage. All those subsidies that get reduced gets put into your trust fund. And that's really an important thing because under the law, Medicare trust fund uh, uh, part A would have be, uh, become um, not, not defunct, but would not remain solvent uh, through the year 2017. Because of the law, your trust fund, Part A, will remain solvent to the year 2026. So there are two bills that I want to talk about real briefly. Um, one has to do, if you look at your um, pieces of paper, look at the uh, the one on one side will say budget battles 2013 Medicare drug discounts and then on the back you'll see a letter that three of our um, officers at the National ARA um, signed to Senator Klobuchar. These are two things I want to mention before I stop talking. Under the law that Medicare Part D pass, and again, you know, there's some really good things about Medicare Part D. It helps pay for some of seniors' medications, obviously. But under the law that passed um, in 2003 by one vote in the middle of the night, they basically, the Congress took out the following. Before um, the law pa passed um, in 2003, those consumers, seniors, and people with disabilities who were both Medicaid and Medicare eligible, we call it dual eligibility. Those consumers who were getting medications, the pharmaceutical companies had to rebate those consumers who are Medicaid, Medicare eligible, dual eligible, and all those rebates had to be put in your Medicare trust fund. Senate Bill 740 again, if you look at the Medicare drug discounts, that was introduced by Senator Rockefeller from West Virginia, restores that anyone who's on Medicaid and Medicare, dual eligible seniors or people with disabilities, pharmaceutical companies had again had to rebate all those people and all those dollars go into your Medicare trust fund. So this is a second bill, if you agree with this, that we're asking you to talk to your Congressman Petri and your U.S. Senators Johnson and Baldwin. Now I'm going to talk about Senate Bill 117. Now remember what I said a couple of minutes ago, and I'm going to stop in two minutes so we get a chance for questions and concerns, what Leon and I have said. Under the law, in 2003, that was passed by one vote, in the middle of the night, 3 o'clock in the morning, there is a provision in that law that said the following. The federal government, un through Medicare, cannot negotiate 
lower prices for the about 50 uh, Americans are Medicare beneficiaries. They could not negotiate lower prices for the medications that many seniors in our country get today with the pharmaceutical companies. The Veterans Administration does exactly that, and the veterans have earned that they, the Veterans Administration, negotiates lower prices for its veterans. In fact, Leon Brzezinski, a veteran, and Billy Feiling are a Medicare Part D consumer by the same medication. Leon, a vet, spends 35% le less than I would as a Medicare Part D consumer. Now, Leon as a veteran and all the veterans earned that right. But the 50 million American who are Medicare beneficiaries should have that same thing happen to them through Medicare to negotiate lower prices. And the reason why I brought up the, the whole issue of the middle of the night, the Medicare Part D law passed back in 2003, two of the people, one of them specifically, his name was, he used to be a representative from uh, Louisiana named Billy Tazine. Billy Tazine and someone from the former President Bush's office now work for the Pharmaceutical Society of America. Billy Tazine, back in 2005, 2006, had an annual salary of over $2 million. I'm an idealist, but I do really understand why people are cynical about government. That, that these two people, could then work for the pharmaceutical companies. It was not in their interest, the pharmaceutical companies, to allow Medicare to negotiate. Senate Bill 117, which was introduced by Senator Klobuchar, who's a, rep who's a U.S. Senator from Minnesota, would, would actually then have the Medicare negotiate for lower prices, just like the Veterans Administration that does uh, for the veterans. So we're asking you, if you support the idea that we talked about with Leon with Senate Bill 567, Senate Bill 740, talking about the pharmaceutical companies rebating, which is in the document you have, the pharmaceutical rebates have to go to the Medicare Trust Fund and then be able to negotiate through Senate Bill 117. We ask you to call or write Congressman Petri and Senators Johnson and Senator Baldwin. At this point, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions um, that you might have or concerns or something that I've said or Leon have said that's confusing. We need to leave around 20 after 10. We're going to Green Bay after this. Any questions, comments, concerns? The last time we were here, the whole meeting room was totally filled. Um, and thanks to the Sheboygan News, they had done a story uh, so obviously we're not, we wish more people would come because obviously a lot of people who have heard different stories and we're trying our best to give you the best facts that we know of at this point in terms of Social Security and Medicare, end of September and into October, Congress will be debating the deficit the, and, and the debt ceiling and we're going to push back and work hard and that's why we're asking each of you to help us here today to make sure that our congressional elected officials know where we stand on these important earned retirement programs as well as uh, the Affordable Health Care Act. The first time my wife and I heard about this was a little blur from the Sheboygan Press this morning. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it, we had a, a great turnout in La Crosse and Eau Claire because the, the traditional media really publicized um, and, you know, we're very limited in how much, we don't have a lot of money, we can't do paid media, we do some mailing to some people to get some of our members to know about it. We use the, we use, uh, you know, uh, internet, online ways, but um, it's hard. Yeah. Yeah, they did a big story the last time we were here about two years ago. We had 75 people here. They did a front page story. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sheboygan, and it was just a notice. I don't know if it came from one of the two. It came from me. Yeah, and so that was came from, came from Ron. Oh, Ron back there too. That's oh, right. Thank you, Ron. Yes. Thank you. Um, so that's the only reason I heard about it. Number one, number two. I want to have a question. But sure. I find I'm 67. I find this area so incomprehensible. 
I had four years of math in high school, including the advanced math two, and four years of college. You can talk, and I, I call myself a political. I read three newspapers, including a national newspaper. I just find this, I don't know if any of you find this, I just find it, I, uh, I get stymied. I wish I had a great question to ask you. So, so you're basically saying you're, you get overwhelmed about the healthcare system in yeah. general and then the specifics as it relates. Well, I was very interesting. I was able to follow this when I took care of my mother for 12 years. Mm -hmm. And I did monitor her bills. And I, of course, have the same stories all of you have. Massive amounts of mistakes, including being in a nursing home under private pay and then falling while her alarm bell is ringing, but nobody will come and help her falling and breaking a bone in her pelvis, and then she was kicked back on Medicare, of course, to pay the bill, but then she got double billed. Mm -hmm. I mean, she got billed for her private care, which she had been paying, but now she, and, and then Medicare was billed too. I mean, I, mean, I just and find, and I, I never thought people were being purposely obfuscate, obfuscating, uh, trying to cheat, it just, it was seemed like they were overwhelmed. And I'm having a little bit harder time with myself because it's easier to do something for another. Is there some place that somebody like me <laughs> um, can, can just, I mean, I, I know it's, there's the government pamphlet, but even all of, I just find this so, and the other thing I worry about. And what are you looking for? Just keep on finishing. Oh, okay. The other thing I worry about is I, I believe in, I don't even call it Obamacare. I call it the Affordable Health Act. Right. Yeah. Uh, I always say that, I don't shortcut it, but I always wonder, we know all that the pharmaceutical companies and the private insurance companies and stuff have this lobby and are producing uh, documents and propaganda all the time, but who speaks for the government? I mean, who in the government is churning? We're not, we're not the government. Oh, I absolutely understand. Yeah. But I mean, I, I'm just expressing a concern sure. as a person who supports Medicare and Social Security and realizing that there is no equal voice to, I feel, get out the information about what affordable health care actually is outside of thank you for coming. But do you see what I mean? Sure. I mean, I need three or four points right now. Right. I hear you. The, if you're really confused about your bills and you think something's wrong, yeah. you can call the ADRC and ask the Pat Affleck. She's a benefit specialist, and she will always try to straighten out any medical problems that you're having. And it's really important, <laughs> right. be because if we can get a handle on the fraud and duplication, our hope is that we will save money and or put money back into the trust fund for people who are being fraudulent. And we had, we organized, and Leon, when he was the president, um, led a uh, panel discussion with uh, Secretary Sebelius. Uh, in Milwaukee from the um, Health and Human Service Department. And even in the first short period of time with the law, they've recouped a lot of money from fraud. And we need to keep on doing better jobs with that, be more efficient, not have duplication, because all those kinds of savings or revenue that comes back into the trust fund means that we don't have to even look at any kind of cuts for specific benefits for Medicare beneficiaries. But you, I think she's absolutely right. The county elder, for, does everybody know the county elder benefit specialist, well, who they are? And we're the only state in the union that has them. Right. That's right. The only state. Yeah. If you went to the aging department here in Sheboygan, if you wanted to look at what are your possibilities for uh, your health insurance plans as a Medicare beneficiary, every year there's a window of opportunity where you can decide to change your plan and not be penalized. But, but to the point that Carol was raising, it's also a person who, one, has only your interests at heart, but also can help with questions like, what should I do with these duplicative bills? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Or why do they have on there, I'm paying this when I was told I was going to pay this much. Those county elder benefits, and as you said, we're the only state in the country that has at least 72 for every county, each has one person, at least one, maybe more. Uh, so if anybody has any questions or is considering thinking about wanting to change their plan, um, Pat Hefferman, is that her last name? Yeah. Um, from the aging department, the elder men of special for Sheboygan would be a great source for any of you to talk to. I think one thing you need to understand about all, what, what, the two issues we just talked about and any issue that has a, food stamps, 
is there's an ideological battle going on. There's a whole group of folks that believe there should be no programs whatsoever that help anyone. That's what this really is about. Ever since the day Social Security was enacted, the Republicans have been trying to do away with it. The whole idea, uh, you, you probably don't know this, but there was the health plan, there was a, a national health plan included with Social Security by Roosevelt at the time. But there was no way, he knew he couldn't get both through Congress, so he decided that Social Security was the most important for him. That's why we didn't get Medicare until uh, in the 60s. But ever since Medicare has been enacted, there's been a, another group. And right now you have a group of about 40 people in Congress, 40 people, that are holding the entire country hostage and, and have raised this whole ideological issue to, uh, to the top of the list. You got a, a leader of the Republicans in the Congress that has no control over his membership whatsoever. He's doing things that he don't even agree with because they're so afraid they're gonna have somebody run against them in a primary. So this whole ideological thing, you know, I worked for the union for a long time. We could never understand people voting against their own best interest, and I still can't. I can't, to me, a senior voting for someone that wants to cut your programs is like a chicken voting for Colonel Sanders. I just can't understand that folks don't understand what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And I know that people don't know what the CPI, the chain CPI is, it doesn't make sense. And even after I explain it, I've had people say, well, no, it's not really that bad. Well, it's never that bad till your ox is gored. And it seems to me sooner or later, I mean, I sat in a, I'll give you one last example. I sat in a Senator Feingold meeting a few years ago in Waukesha County where I live, which is a hell of a place to live if you're a Democrat. And the guy sitting next to me, this elderly couple, and the guy's telling me how he don't want government in his health care. After all, his wife just had a $70,000 operation and Medicare paid for the whole work. So he don't want government in his health care. Now think about that for a moment. Medicare is the government program that this guy doesn't want in his health care. I mean, it makes no sense. And he's earned the right to have. That tells you how disconnected people are with the benefits. And part of the major problem with this entire Affordable Care Act is we have never had to think about health insurance. We always had it where we worked. And you know how we got it? Did anybody tell me how we got health care to start with, health insurance? We got it during the Second World War when Roosevelt froze wages and jawboned the unions and employers into giving no wage increases while they were up getting this warm manufacturing machine up and coming. And so health insurance is what they got in lieu of wage increases. It was a few cents an hour in those days because of course we didn't have all these fancy systems we have. That's how we got employer funded health insurance in the first place. And it kind of took over and in the meantime the health, the, the whole health system took off and the, uh, and the cost got skyrocketing. And, and basically, if you go to, went to a doctor under a health plan over the last 20 years or so, whether you got coverage or not was decided by some bureaucrat sitting on the third floor in an office in a cubby hole. And, and the health insurance companies admit this. Their entire goal was to see if get somebody else to pay. And that's why bills would be submitted one or two or three times and rejected and finally paid. Because you know, we've had a, the perfect example is the California case where the lady had health insurance where her employer had cancer, is being treated for cancer a couple months in. The health insurance drops her, says we don't cover you anymore. She ended up winning the law, several million dollars in the lawsuit. And this was golden rule insurance, the largest insure, health insurer in the country. And for them, a paying a five or six million dollar settlement is nothing. I mean, it's pocket change to these folks. But there are whole floors on every, I just drove by three insurance companies on the way up here, I think on I-43, and every one of them's got a whole floor whose only job is to see if we can get somebody else to pay that we don't pay. And I defy any health insurance executive to deny that because it's, it's been admitted in, in uh, testimony before Congress and in, in these court suits. So that's what we're, we're facing here, we're facing uh, uh, folks that are not educated about the entire issue of health insurance. We just know that when we get sick, we want to go to the doctor and get, get taken care of. And if we don't have insurance, the emergency room is where it takes place. And it, it's a shame that as a country, the wealthiest country in the world, on a, in a health provision uh, uh, scale, we're 29th or 30th 
in the world. In health I, performances. In health in performances. We're 33. Well, it depends, I guess, who you have. The last I read was 29. But again, it depends who you, who you, who you, whose scale you're using. The fact remains is 29 or 33, neither one of those are very good. And yet, we all think we got the greatest thing going because after all, we just walked to the doctor's office and if we got a Medicare card or we got an insurance card, we hand it to them. Yes. Um, you know, you say the emergency room is the only place to go for health care. If you don't have, if you don't have, don't have yeah. Insurance. But so many things, especially for elderly, I mean, the weekends, what do you do? You can't sit at home and wait till Monday, so you use the emergency room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a doctor because they've kind of said, well, if you need a doctor, we're always here. So we we, uh, we're not talking about cases like that. Okay. That's a whole different okay. story. Okay. We're talking about Billy's kid playing okay. soccer and he okay. don't have insurance. I mean, I, I was an EMT, a, a volunteer EMT in my little town I lived in for 10 years, nine, nine and a half years. And I can tell you that there were, even in those days, it was surprising because Nobody ever thought that we, where we live in Washington County, we should have anybody that's poor. And yet I was on the United Way board and one in four people had received a United Way service in the course of a year. They do a, a study every year. And we, and we had several folks that we took to the hospital in that time I was there that uh, I never would have thought that they didn't have insurance until we got them an ambulance and started filling out the forms. Maybe quickly tell us: Are you giving this presentation in surrounding communities, and if so, where and when? Um, well, we're doing them throughout the state. We're doing this next one, and we got to leave in about two minutes here in Green Bay. Um, we are going up to Superior and Spooner on Monday. Over the last few weeks, we've gone all over the state to from Racine to uh, Appleton. Uh, we're doing one in October 10th in Wasaw. Um, Do we get any in Sheboygan County? No, the, no, we're, not another one. We, we, we don't have the resources. Yeah, I wish we could. But we are going at least one time around many of the places throughout the state. Thanks so much for coming and uh, have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.